morning, everyone. We are Terry and Nancy Schott. Hey, we miss you, church, but we're so glad you're here worshiping with us virtually. The church is so important to us. Through the church, we are encouraged. We are used by God, and we are taught by God. We miss not seeing each of you in person because God uses each of you in our lives to build us up as believers in Jesus. I can hardly wait to see you all again. It won't be long now. It won't be long. Together, apart. But together, for sure. Hey, Woodlands Church, we're so glad that you are here to worship with us today, this morning, tonight, whenever or wherever you are watching with us. In Psalm 73, the psalmist says, Who have I in heaven but you? And earth is nothing that I desire besides you. My heart and flesh may fail, but you are the strength of my heart and my portion forever. We are here to worship our God. We are here to declare that he is worthy of all of our praise. So wherever you are, we invite you to worship with us right now. Let's sing together. Found in 
that we are walking with you. Lord, that we are walking in your love. And we are building our life in your firm foundation. That you're leading us to love those around us. To continue worshiping you and praising your name. So we pray that you will be glorified through these songs. We continue to praise you and give you the glory alone. We pray all this in your holy name. Amen. Hello, Woodlands. Happy Memorial Day weekend. I hope uh, this Memorial Day weekend you get some good time with your friends and your family. And I uh, hope you get outside and enjoy the weather. And speaking of family... Have you ever noticed how families have different things that are important to them? Each family sort of has a flavor, certain things that are values for different families. For instance, some families like emphasize the importance of respect or they'll emphasize the importance of honesty or hard work or success or, hey, let's have fun as a family. Maybe that's a, a value or education. They value that very highly or making money or having the right political stance. There are different essentials in families. So I want to talk about family essentials in God's family today. Just like uh, human families have essentials and things that are important to them, so in God's family from the early days in the pages of Scripture, when he first formed for himself a people, there were certain things that God made clear are essentials for him. And we want to think about those. There are two that we want to think about uh, today. We want to think about two essentials that God wanted his family, wants his family, to be grounded in as we finish up our Grounded and Going series this morning. So let me give you a little background to these, uh, these two essentials that have been over God's people from the very beginning. A little bit of a background on the whole story of the Bible. So remember Adam and Eve, the first human sinned. And right away when God uh, saw the sin of Adam and Eve, uh, being a loving and a caring God, he promised that he would bring redemption, that he would bring forgiveness, that he would work in people's lives, that he had a plan to bring a wandering humanity back to himself. And as the pages of scripture unfolded, as uh, the plan unfolded in human history, it became clear that God was going to choose a representative people, the nation of Israel, and through this representative people, he would send a savior and through this representative people, he would uh, prepare humanity to receive the salvation that the Savior Jesus Christ was going to bring. And from the beginning of the formation of that people, the people of Israel, he emphasized these two essentials that we're going to think about uh, today. So if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to Exodus chapter 15. And uh, let me set the stage for you as you turn to Exodus chapter 15. So God, as he was forming this representative people, the nation of Israel, he formed them largely through a 400-year period of slavery in Egypt. And the nation grew, the people of Israel grew to being over a million strong. And then came that uh, seminal moment in the, in the people's history when God delivered the nation of Israel from Egyptian captivity. And you know the story of the exodus out of, out of Egypt and how God defeated the Egyptian gods. And so Exodus 15, they've come out of Egypt now. And the Egyptian army has been defeated in the Red Sea. And the nation of Israel knows that they're free. They're released. They're celebrating. They write a song of thanksgiving and a praise to God. And they're out in the wilderness, this large group over a million strong worship. And they sing praise to God. And then God comes to them and speaks to them and begins to tell them about essential number one. And essential number one is this. He's going to make clear to them that he wants them grounded in his word. So let's look at it. We're going to pull up a scripture here on the screen for you this morning. This is from Exodus chapter 15, verse 26. And it says this. God said, If you will give earnest heed to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight and give ear to his commandments, and keep all of his statutes. I will put none of the diseases on you, which I have put on the Egyptians. For I, the Lord, 
am your healer. So you look at this scripture and you see God saying to his people, I want you to listen to my voice. I want you to pay attention to my commands, to my statutes, to my words, to do what is right in my sight. Give ear to what I say to you. So he tells them this as he's gathered them out in the wilderness. And now he's about to send them on a journey so that he can give them his word. So what happens next in the narrative of Exodus is that for three months, they travel from just coming out of Egypt. They travel to Mount Sinai. And it's at Mount Sinai in the God's work amongst his people that he's going to give them his word. The word that he's just told them that he wants them to obey and to follow. And to follow. So this is a significant moment in their history. So they travel to Mount Sinai. And at Mount Sinai, when they get there, the first thing that takes place when they get to Mount Sinai, think about this. The first thing that God does is he brings this representative people out of captivity is he brings them to this mountain which becomes sacred in their history because here he gives them his word, his law, his commands so that they can obey it and become a people grounded in the essential of his word. Let's look at the story and what happens. Exodus chapter 19. Here's how the text reads. Moses went up to God, up on the mountain, Mount Sinai, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and you shall say to the sons of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my Covenant. Let's stop on that word for a minute, covenant. So he's about to talk to them about a covenant relationship that he's going to form with them. And we know it's about obedience to his voice, about obedience to his word. So he says, if you will obey what I say, keep my covenant. Let's read on. Then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples of the earth for all the earth is mine. So God's saying, I'm forming you as my people, my family, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words, God says to Moses, these are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. So Moses came down, called the elders of the people, set before them all these words which the Lord had commanded him. Let's read on. And all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And then Moses brings back the words of the people to God. So God comes to them and says, listen, I'm, gonna, I'm about to give you my word and I'm about to enter into a covenant relationship with you to make you my people. But you're going to have to obey my word. And the people say, yeah, we want to do that. Yes, that's what we want to do. And that's who we want to be. We want to be your people grounded in your word. So what happens next? So in the rest of Exodus 19, God says to Moses, okay, consecrate the people because I'm about to give them my word. And there's this dramatic occurrence that happens at the end of Exodus 19 where Moses consecrates the people. He sets them apart to God and uh, then God calls Moses up onto the mountain. He tells the people, you can't come up, just Moses. But God gives them this dramatic demonstration of the importance of this moment. Because all of a sudden, this, the top of Mount Sinai is covered with lightning and thunder and cloud and smoke and fire. And to make it clear that this is a supernatural event on top of all of these things. They hear the sound of a trumpet coming from the mountain. And the text says real clearly in Exodus 19 that the, the sound of the trumpet gets louder and louder and louder. And the people are in awe. They're in reverent fear before God about what is to happen. And Moses goes up to meet with God. And the first word that Moses hears from God as he goes up onto that mountain are these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, 
out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. We all should recognize that as the first of the Ten Commandments. So Exodus 20 is God giving his people the Ten Commandments. And this becomes the foundation of that covenant that he's alluded to, that he would make with them. Those Ten Commandments become central to who they are as a people. They define what it means to be the people of God. But Exodus 20 and the Ten Commandments is not all that he gives them. He gives them a series of laws in chapter 21 and chapter 22 and 23. There are laws about justice. There are laws about the fair treatment of people. There are laws about the Sabbath and how important it is to keep the Sabbath as a day of rest, but also as a day to remember and worship God. There are, day, there are laws about worship celebrations and different festivals. God is, again, shaping his people. And he's doing that by saying, here's what I want you to do. Here's the body of truth, of law, of command. Here's my word. This is the covenant. If you're going to be my people, you need to be grounded in the words of this covenant. And so that's what Chapters 20 through 23 are. So Moses receives all of that from God. And then he comes back down again to the people. And in chapter 24 of Exodus, let's look at what happens next. Moses came and he recounted to the people all the words of the Lord and all the ordinances. And all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord has spoken, we will do. So they hear the Ten Commandments. They hear the laws of justice and laws about the Sabbath and laws about worship and all those things. And they say, yes, we want to do that. And so Moses now formalizes their words into this covenant that God has talked about with them. Verse 4, Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord and then he arose early in the morning. And watch his deliberate action here. This is a very deliberate formation of a people around a covenant to obey the words of God. He arose early in the morning. He built an altar at the foot of the mountain with 12 pillars representing the 12 tribes of Israel. He sent young men of the sons of Israel and they offered burnt offerings offerings and sacrificed young bulls and peace offerings to the Lord. Moses took half of the blood of those offerings, put it on the basins, and the other half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant. He read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, so they're repeating their words again, as this covenant is formed, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do and we will be obedient. So Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and he said, Behold, the blood of the covenant, which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all of these words of yours. So what's happening in Exodus 24 is the formalization of this reality that the people of God are going to be a people of the book, of his word, grounded in his essentials. This is the heart of the covenant. What God says, we will do. We will be his people. It was an incredible start to the nation of Israel. Unfortunately, the follow through on that start was horrible. So they said, we're going to obey everything that God does. Well, what happens with this representative people? We know what happens with this representative people. Remember, they are a representative people. People, they are going to relate to the, the words of God like we would have had we been there. And what we all have, what they had as well, was a sin nature. And so the people who make this sacred promise, God's people, that they're going to obey his word, don't. And the history of Israel is a history of a representative people who repeatedly and consistently choose to go their own way, do their own thing, ignore the words of the covenant, and not stay grounded in God's word. 
The law was given because it was God's heart, but it was also given to show us through them that we on our own cannot keep the words of the covenant. That we on our own need a savior. Those many hundreds of years that God dealt with his people over and over again, calling them back to his word repeatedly through prophets and other means, and they would keep disobeying. They were a representative people. The, the, the words of God never ceased to be important, but they couldn't do them. And so God sent a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he formed not a representative people, but he would go on to form by giving his life on the cross, a redeemed people. And this redeemed people that we, the church, are a part of the church worldwide, this new redeemed community who now lives under a new covenant. But the heart of this new covenant is still fidelity to his word. It's still being grounded in the importance of his word. The difference is that we don't have to do it on our own. Jesus comes to indwell us by his spirit and he gives us the strength to obey his word. But his word remains central to who we are as a people. So for instance, in the Sermon on the Mount, the kind of the manifesto of the kingdom of God in, in Matthew chapter five, Jesus said, don't think that I came to abolish the law. Don't think that I came to eliminate the need for being grounded in God's word, his truth. I came to establish it. At the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he talks about people who will one day stand before him in judgment and he will say to some on that day, I never knew you. And the basis on which he will say that is because you practice lawlessness. You set aside my commands, my words. So the law remains essential. The commandments of God, I should say, remain essential. But now it's Jesus doing it in, in us and for us giving us the strength. And so Jesus could say in John chapter 14, verse 21, he who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. So we, the redeemed people of God, are still a people who he calls to be grounded in his word. This is the first family essential. It hasn't changed. It's just that now we have a savior and a leader and a king, the Lord Jesus Christ, who does in us and for us what we could not do for ourselves. But we are still a people of his word. Well, there's a second family essential. So I kind of skipped over um, something that happened in that three-month journey to Sinai. In the book of Exodus, we went, we jumped from chapter 15 to chapter 19. I want to go back to chapter 17 in Exodus. And I want to tell you about a fascinating in, in, incident that happened in the life of the people of God. So if you have a Bible, open it to Exodus uh, 17. Let me give you a little uh, background on this. Again, the people are journeying. Uh, uh, to Mount Sinai. And as they're journeying to Mount Sinai, God's going to teach them in a very striking way that the second essential, the second thing that they need to stay grounded in is prayer. They need to be a people marked by dependence on God through prayer. So as they're traveling to Sinai, they encounter this group of people that resist them. And they're called Amalek. I'm going to read some uh, words, words here uh, from Exodus chapter 17, verse 8, which go like this. Amalek came and fought against Israel at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, choose men for us and go fight against Amalek. So there's an enemy. And Moses says, tomorrow I'm going to station myself on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. Joshua did just as Moses told him and fought against Amalek. There's so a couple of surprises here. Uh, surprise number one, there's more conflict. Maybe the people of Israel thought, I thought the conflict was over. Well, I thought, you know, Egypt was our enemy and God defeated them in the Red Sea. We thought it would be kind of smooth sailing from here on out, but it's not. And so this enemy comes, Amalek, and fights against them. Surprise number one, there's conflict. Surprise number two is, remember in Egypt when... Um, 
God was delivering his people from Egyptian captivity, he said to them, you don't have to fight. I'm going to fight for you. All of a sudden in this fight, they have to fight. Joshua goes down with an army into face-to-face, hand-to-hand combat, combat against the people of Amalek. And what happens with Moses and the leaders? Fascinating story. Look at verse uh, 11. So it came, or so it came, excuse me, verse 10. Joshua did as Moses told him, fought against Amalek. Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. It came about when Moses held his hand up that Israel prevailed. And when he let his hand down, Amalek prevailed. What is going on here? Is this some kind of magic? Of course it's not magic. We don't believe in magic. Magic's not part of scripture. What Moses is doing is he's calling out to God for help. They would often pray with hands lifted. So this is Moses saying, Joshua, you go down and fight and I'm going to stand and I'm going to pray for you in the fight. And he prays with hands uplifted and when he's, his hands are up, Joshua is winning and the tide is going this way. And when his hands are down, it's going the other way and they begin to be defeated. So what does Moses do? Verse 12, Moses' hands were heavy. They took a stone, they put it under him and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and one on the other. And thus his hands were steady until the sun set. So these two guys come on either side of Moses and they keep his hands up in the air representing prayer and then it ends in verse 13 so Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword so I want you to think about a couple of one thing this is such a striking story in scripture there's no magic in having hands up this was a object lesson this was such a clear teaching moment you're going to see that in a second this is such a clear powerful defining moment in the nation's history God is showing them that in the fight which you are going to continue to have the fight will be won through my help as you ask me for help the fight will be won you will advance as a people as you pray hands up in prayer And you're going to be victorious. Hands down, stop praying, and you're going to lose. This was the big object lesson. How do I know it was a big object lesson? Well, I want to take you to the last three verses of Scripture that describe what happens here. And we're going to look at uh, this uh, up on the screen. So in verse 14 of Exodus 17, here's what it says. The Lord said to Moses... Write this down on a scroll as a reminder and recite it to Joshua that I will completely blot out the memory of Amalek under heaven. So this is so important to God that he says to Moses, I don't want you to forget this moment. God knows that Joshua is going to be the leader that takes over for him. And so God says to Moses, write this down on a scroll so that Joshua won't forget this moment. And Moses built an altar and he named it, the Lord is my banner. And he said, indeed, my hand is lifted up toward the Lord's throne. The Lord will be at war with Amalek from generation to generation. So three things that I want to draw from this text. I want you to notice, first of all, I want you to notice that there seems to be a contradiction here, but there's not. Why is that? Because first he says, God says, I'm going to completely blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Like Amalek's going to go away, it seems to say. But then at the last, it says, the Lord will be at war with Amalek from generation to generation. So how do we put that together and what are, what's the principle? So there are three principles, I think, from this text. First principle is this, there will always be a fight. So Amalek is both a real people that Joshua defeated, that God blotted out in that moment, but they are also a representative people. They are a people that represents the fact that we as God's children will always have conflict. There will always be a spiritual battle raging against the people of God. Jesus 
himself faced this when he began his public ministry. What was the first thing that happened when Jesus began his public ministry? He went into the wilderness for 40 days to fast and pray. And what happened in the wilderness? At the end of it, Satan comes to him with a powerful temptation. So even the Son of God himself has this conflict. This incident in Exodus 17 teaches us, first of all, that we as the people of God are always going to be opposed, resisted. The kingdom of God will always have its enemies. There will always be a fight. The second thing we learn from this incident in Exodus 17 is that victory in this fight is God's, but it's through our prayers. Again, think about the obvious lesson of this. Hands up and the enemy is defeated. Hands down and the enemy begins to win. The obvious lesson that God has for us through this incident is, I want you to remember, and he's, he, you know, Moses builds an altar so that we don't forget, and he names the altar. He says, that the, this, the Lord is our strength, the, the Lord is our help, and he, and he, and he says of the altar, this, is, this represents a hand upon the throne of the Lord. This represents the fact that victory came when we kept praying when we kept calling out to God for help. So the first lesson, there will always be a fight. Second lesson, victory in this fight is God's victory, but it's through our prayers. We as the people of God need to stay rooted in prayer. And the third lesson from this incident in Exodus 17, Exodus 17, is that perseverance and persistence in prayer matter. You see it in this account. Got to keep the hands up. You see this emphasized by our leader of the new covenant, Jesus, who taught multiple different teachings and parables about prayer. And one of the things that he emphasized repeatedly in his teaching about prayer is that we as the people of God must keep at it. That we need to persist. So we as a people of God are to be rooted in two things. There are two family essentials. We need to stay rooted, grounded in God's word because we're a people of the covenant. We're a people of the book. We need to stay rooted in prayer because God is the one who gives the victory. He's our help. He's our strength. We can't do it on our own. We need him desperately and we dare not ever forget that. You know, this series that we've been in called Grounded and Going was based, we told you at the beginning as we finished the series up, we told you it's based on uh, two of our values as a church. One is going, which represents what we've been studying in Acts together, that we are to be a people who are constantly going with the good news of Jesus Christ to our world. And then the second is that we are to stay grounded and that we are to stay grounded in these two essentials, the word and prayer. I want to show you how we state that value as a church. So I'm going to pull it up on the screen here. One of our values we call, we call grounded. This is one of our priorities. And uh, so here's how we say it. This is our value, Woodlands Church. We aspire to be a Christ-centered community grounded in the Bible and prayer. Here's what we say about the Bible. The Bible is God's word, our ultimate authority. So we believe, you know, this is our authority. This is what governs our life. So we say the Bible is God's word, our ultimate authority. And so we seek to study it. It's what we do on Sunday mornings. It's what we do as small groups. It's what we do in youth group and children's children's ministry. We seek to study it, understand it, and be transformed by it. Our value as a church is not just that we know it and understand it, not just that we can regurgitate what the Bible says, but that we allow it to change our lives. And so the next phrase reads, therefore it will be the basis of our teaching, shape our ministries, guide our decisions, and govern our conduct. I love that statement that we have as a church about the value of the word in our lives and the need to stay grounded in it. But I also love what we say about prayer. Prayer is powerful and essential in the pursuit of God and his purposes. Boy, doesn't Exodus 17 emphasize that? It was powerful, hands up, 
and they experienced victory. Hand down, hands down, they experienced defeat. It was essential in the pursuit of God's purposes for them, and it remains so for us. Therefore, we will, this is our heartbeat, Woodlands, we will engage in widespread and consistent prayer at all levels of church life. What does that mean, all levels of church life? It means we want to we always want to be thinking about ways to pray corporately, to pray in small groups, to pray as families, to pray as individuals. Prayer is essential. These two things are the family essentials in God's family, grounded in his word, grounded in prayer. I want to end this Grounded in uh, Going series. Uh, I want to end today by taking you to back to one final lesson in the book of Acts. So the going part of this series was the read-through that we did together as a church in the book of Acts, which we just finished this past week. So one final lesson from Acts. Remember in Acts chapter 2, the church is born, the new covenant, the new the redeemed people of God is born on the day of Pentecost. And remember when Peter preaches that first sermon and revival breaks out and he offers the person of Jesus Christ to people if they will believe in him, it says 3,000 people believe. A little bit later in chapter 4, as the gospel continues to spread and revival is happening, in chapter 4, it says that there were now, the number of those who believed in growing from 3,000 people, men, women, and children, to 5,000 men. And so there were at least twice that many. So they went from 3,000 to 5,000. And then, and then in chapter 5, remember, it, it, they stopped counting. And it just says multitudes of people kept coming to the Lord. And there's this powerful revival that's going on in the book of Acts. And they're trying to shepherd all of these people and care for them and keep them rooted in what's important and meet their needs. And one of the things that they were doing, we saw in Acts, is they were caring for people's physical needs. That was important, but it wasn't the most important thing. And so in Acts chapter 6, they faced a crisis. And the crisis was, are we going to put most of our attention on physical or spiritual? Both are important. Both are necessary for the church to be engaged in. But we represent Jesus. We have the gospel. And so here's what the leaders of the church in Acts 6 say. The, se the 12, uh, that's the leadership, summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, it isn't desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. What the, what's going on here? They were so busy trying to meet every physical need that all of a sudden the emphasis on the word and prayer was going down. So here's what they said. Therefore, brethren, select some people that we can put in charge of this very important thing of caring for people's needs. But it said, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So we'll listen to what the leadership of the early church said. We have to keep central. We have to stay grounded in God's word and in prayer. And they did. They didn't neglect physical needs, but they kept this as central. And then the text goes on to say, and the church continued to grow. So Woodlands, this is God's call on our life. Let's, by his grace, continue to stay rooted in these two family essentials. God's word and prayer. Let's pray together right now. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your goodness and your grace. Your goodness and grace expressed to us in the gift of your word that shows us how you want us to live and, and that you give us strength by your spirit to do that. So God, thank you for your word and thank you for the fact that your help is just a prayer away that you hear our prayers, that you answer them, that you want us to stay connected to you through our prayers and through your word. And I pray that we as a people, we pray together that we as a people would remain grounded in your word, grounded in prayer. We ask in your name, amen. Hey, Woodlands Church, before, uh, before we end the service, uh, just want to tell you what's coming next for a second. So because we are people who are grounded in the word, uh, starting next week, we're going to begin a study. And the title of that study is called Encouragement When Life Gets Hard. We're going to study together a book of the New Testament that was written to a, a group of people where life got hard. 
where they went through a lot of difficulties and just like we are threatened, some of us, with loss of livelihood and loss of health, they were threatened with loss of livelihood and loss of life. But not through a pandemic, not through a virus, but through the persecution. And so the early church faced a season when life got very hard. And the book of 1 Peter was written to give them encouragement. It will be so timely for us to study 1 Peter together this summer. I look forward to beginning that with you next week. Have a great rest of your Memorial Day weekend. Hi, Woodlands family. Hello, we're the Mellenbachers, and we're so thankful to have a church family like you to worship with on a Sunday morning. Bye, have a good day. Bye. <laughs> Bye.